Hello and welcome to another episode of the Business of Business podcast. I'm your host, Roy. Of course, we are the podcast that bring you a wide variety of guests to talk about a bunch of diverse topics to help you in business. And, uh, you know, we want to see you succeed. Sometimes as small business people, we don't really know what we don't know or if we do know that we have a, uh, a shortfall somewhere, you know, trying to find somebody that can help us, uh, that can be a trick too. So uh, uh, today is no different. We have an awesome guest with us, Bob Wheeler. He's a financial expert and motivator. He is the book author and founder of The Money Nerve, and he is also the CFO of the world famous comedy store. So we may dive into that just a little bit more as well, but Bob, welcome to the show. Thanks for taking time out of your day to be with us. We certainly appreciate it. Well, thank you, Roy. It's great to be here. I always love having these conversations. Yeah, great. So tell us a little bit about, you know, what inspired you to write the book? And I think that, uh, uh, I think it's a little deeper than just the book. It looks like that, you know, you actually have uh, kind of a, a website or some stuff to go along with the book. So kind of tell us a little bit more about that. Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, I went into accounting after uh, deciding I didn't want to be a lawyer. Um, I was all set for law school. Uh, I was taking accounting as uh, to get my grades up because it was uh, a pretty easy A. And, uh, you know, I got into accounting, but I had my own financial struggles that I wasn't really aware of. And I struggled between having lots of money and following my creativity. Um, I settled initially on money <laughs> because uh, that seemed to give me more choice. Uh, and as I was working, um, I was doing comedy. I was a, I'm CFO at the comedy store. And one of my friends came in and she was upset because her parents and her siblings, who are all doctors, were sort of giving her grief because she had chosen to be a comic. And she was, she was crying and saying, oh, my God, I'm the only one who doesn't understand finance. And I said, you're not, you're not the only one. There's so many people out there and they present well, but they're struggling. And most of us have made financial mistakes. And so I realized in having gone through my own journey and seeing how clients were making you know, decisions that were in exact opposition to what seemed like really sound financial advice, I realized I wanted to write this book to help people start to understand that there was a connection between our emotions our money beliefs and our money blocks and our financial success. Yeah, and that was one thing that really, uh, you know, caught my interest about uh, about yourself and the book is that uh, the emotional part. And you know, we we all are that. And the um, I guess unfortunately we can let that control us instead of thinking things through, being logical. And then the other thing too to you know, whether we have money sense or not, sometimes, you know, we are guilted or goaded into following that path that will make us more money, but then we end up being very unhappy. And so sometimes that whole, uh, you know, follow your heart and uh, everything else works itself out. But anyway, uh, so, you know, what are, well, then the other thing is that you, so uh, you became the CFO of the, the comedy store, which that's, that's awesome. I guess you get to see a, um, you get to see a whole lot from that seat, correct? Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, even that came to me through following my passion. I was doing stand-up comedy and, uh, you know, to supplement my income. And uh, so I was, I was running a show and Mitzi, uh, who owned the comedy store, called me up and said, you know, Bob, I know you're a, a CPA and you got to come help the store. We're having trouble. And for me, initially, it was really about making sure that myself and my friends had a stage to perform on. It wasn't about like, oh, this is some long term thing. And uh, it's really sort of selfish for my yeah. friends and I. And, uh, you know, I jumped in and there were a lot of issues. And I, I really uh, loved working with Mitzi. And, uh, you know, my, a lot of friends of mine are comics. And I, I love being in that creative world. And, and so I do get to see a lot of amazing comics people that make it big or people that you think are super big who are actually broke uh, and others that you would think aren't making that much are making millions. So it's not all as it seems, but it's definitely been a fun, interesting ride. Yeah, I bet. Yeah. And uh, so talk a little bit about the emotions. You know, what is that? You know, how does that impact our decision making when we start talking about finances? Because so many people think that 
well, we can emotionally overeat and we can do, you know, we can get angry out of emotion. And so, you know, I'm sure that, um, and I'm not even going to bring my girlfriend on to talk about her emotional shopping. But anyway, I'll let you, I'll let you pick it up. <laughs> well, you know, the, uh, the best example that I can give that I think is a great illustration was when I was working with my editor on the book, she said to me, hey, Bob, this is great. You're doing this thing about money and emotions, but I don't make any of my decisions financially around money. Like there's no emotion involved. And I said, oh, okay, that's cool. Um, let me ask you this. When you go out to lunch with your uh, dad, who pays for it? And she goes, well, he does. I'm his princess. He has to pay. I said, okay, well, who pays when you go out with your mom? She said, well, I do because I feel so bad that my mom, you know, my dad left her. And so I feel really sorry for her. I said, okay, well, who pays for lunch when you go out with your sister? She goes, oh, we split it Dutch. We're equal. Oh, I get it. I get it. <laughs> so even something like that, <laughs> yeah, right. uh, like splitting the bill at a restaurant with a group of friends, watch the emotions uh, go crazy uh, when somebody's paying for the wine they didn't pay for. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I've got that. Uh, I've got a daughter like that too. You know, she starts out at the uh, top, the cheap stuff on the menu, until she figures out I'm paying for it, and then it's like her her hands. You can see it slide down the menu to the to the expensive <laughs> items. <laughs> I'll have the lobster. <laughs> yeah. yeah, well, you know, and it's it's uh, finance is a funny thing, and I'm of an age that um, when I came through high school, even. Um, I think they taught you how to write a check, maybe how to even how to balance your checkbook. But we, um, you know, we turn people loose. And, and even if you went to college, I, I happen to be a finance major. So, you know, I kind of got more deep into that. But, you know, if you happen to do some other tracks where they don't require you to take finances, like, you know, we turn people out into the world and we've really given them no understanding of finance. It's not something, you know, there are some families I, I know that work together, but uh, it's just an interesting concept that finance is such an important part of our life and being able to maintain housing, you know, utilities, eat, all of that stuff. But we just, uh, we pay very little attention to teaching people about it. Yeah, absolutely. And I have to say, you know, my parents were not great talking about money. They didn't handle money well. And I got out of college and, you know, I was given probably 40 or $50,000 worth of credit cards. And I thought it was free money. <laughs> I was like, cool. I got 50,000 bucks. <laughs> Boom, boom, boom. Spend, spend, spend. Oh, <laughs> this is not good. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, that, that, that's the thing, isn't it? It's easy. Um, I think it's easy to get caught up in that cycle as well. We think, well, we've got to have this now and certainly things are going to be better, you know, next week, next month, and we'll be able to pay it back. And then all of a sudden, you know, we're just, uh, we collapse under so much debt. And again, um, uh, I can't even imagine these kids coming out of college today and the debt that some of them have had to rack up. And yeah. um, unfortunately, they're not able to come out into the, you know, the, I think everybody has the dream. You go to college, you graduate, and, you know, there's a $125,000 uh, job offer on the table when you walk out and life is just uh, smooth and easy after that and unfortunately yeah. that's just not the way you know you end up starting at the bottom so the income is low and all of a sudden it's like we are just uh you know you're starting out life under this crushing debt and uh hopefully they're doing some things about that to help us out but you know i just uh, you really have to worry about that and so many kids are even having to go back home to live that it's anyway it, it's a uh, it's having a huge impact. We'll just say that. It's having a huge impact. And I think if we were started to teach this in high schools and younger, if parents would start to feel more comfortable having conversations about money, even when they don't know, um, and starting early with teaching children about delayed gratification, that we don't have to have everything right this minute. Yes. Yeah, there's a great book about that called... Uh, the marshmallow theory, I think, yeah. is basically, you know, a study over time, the guy gave people a chance, you can have a candy bar now, 
you can wait till tomorrow and get two. And there was some correlation between the impulsiveness that I'm taking my candy bar now and success later in life. And I guess, you know, a lot of it has to do with this. I'll take the money on my credit card today and not thinking about the impacts in the future. Yeah, absolutely. That's the Stanford Marshmallow study. And it's a fascinating study um, in, in, the impact of learning delayed gratification, which is hard in this culture. We've got social media. We've got everybody on uh, Facebook, Instagram, TikTok. Uh, now, now, now. Yeah. 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 And that's something that uh, it, we need to guard against, not only as just humans, but as businesses as well. We only see the, uh, we only see what people want us to see. We don't see the, the negative, uh, you know, the, Nobody ever takes a picture of the overdrawn bank account and waves it on Instagram showing, you, right. you know, what, what dire straits that they're in. You know, we only present the awesome stuff and it can be, a, you know, I'm old enough to where it really doesn't matter. I get it. But, you know, sometimes uh, the younger people that haven't been around a long time, they think that that is life and that these people are, uh, you know, that much more successful. And uh, again, it creates an emotional burden on them. Yeah, absolutely. And we do want to present ourselves as as having success. We're not out there. Yeah, I filed six bankruptcies. <laughs> I, I've had all my cars <laughs> repossessed. Uh, come hang out with me. I'm a inspiration. <laughs> right, exactly. You know, and that the, the other thing, uh, there are tricks and stuff. And I know one thing we used to do, we probably weren't as good as we could have been about it. But you know, when kids, when the kids would get money for birthdays or whatever, you know, we would try to, we bought a, um, it was like a Tupperware plastic bowl that was divided into three sections. And so what we would have them do is uh, they could take a third of it to spend today, a third of it to save. And then if they chose to do the tithing, their third of it for that as well. And, uh, you know, it was pretty good. I don't know the long lasting effects of it. I, I wish we would have started earlier and been a little bit more staunch about it. But, uh, you know, those are the kind of things that I think we can teach our kids that we have to be able to put money back. And we translate this into businesses, uh, you know, especially when you're self-employed, solopreneur, entrepreneur, that uh, you, you have to put money back every time you get a check in order to pay your quarterly taxes. And I mean, I'm just, I'm not even talking about the savings component. I'm just talking yeah. about future expenses that we know because it's unfortunate we have the same, uh, the mindset of that is, you know, income is coming in today. A lot of times they don't really think about the implications of the future, don't put the money back. And then we don't make a quarterly tax payment. And then on um, April 15, you know, now we're trying to come up with this whole ton of money that we just don't have. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, it's, it's funny, um, you know, I'll tell this story, but, uh, you know, my mom used to have an art store years ago. She had an art store and she thought that all the money in the cash register was her profit. <laughs> and so every night she'd empty out the cash register and spend yeah. all the money and didn't understand uh, that my dad had to pay for the supplies that she was selling. And, uh, you don't get to keep it all. Yeah. <laughs> She's like, it's there. It's mine. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. Right. Exactly. Yeah. And we'll compound that effect if you actually have uh, employees that work for you too, because you're yeah. going to have to pay uh, your payroll tax on them. And I know the reason that's kind of fresh, we had a, it was a really good restaurant uh, here in town not long ago that, you know, they'd been in business for years, but they finally went out of business because they evidently hadn't been keeping up on their payroll tax. And, and, you know, those are things that you just can't skirt uh, the, uh, you know, that bill comes due and you might can push it down the road for a little bit, but you can, without going through a whole bunch of legal, I guess, legal maneuvers, there's really no way you're ever going to get out from under that. They're going to get you to the detriment of your business. Yeah, absolutely. And it's so important, especially as an entrepreneur, start having a business paying attention to the finances. I've seen more than I wish I had seen a place ca cases where the bookkeeper was embezzling money, where a salesperson was taking money. And because the, the owner was so busy, like, oh, I love everybody and everything's good. And I don't really want to look at that stuff. Right. They ended up 
uh, self-sabotaging because they weren't actually paying attention. Right. Yeah, and just one more note on the savings component before we move on. Um, one of the, well, of course, the compounding uh, effect is uh, in the time value of money, probably the two yep. biggest theories in finance that just, you know, they change the way you look at things as you go through it. But there was an example they used to use with two sisters that um, save money. I don't know if you're familiar with that, but one of the sisters right out of college, she started putting so much money back. The other sister, she was out traveling, having a good time spending it. And basically what happened is the, the sister that saved, saved for about 15 years, had a baby and never saved another dime which kids will do that to you, but that's another, yeah. that's another podcast issue. Exactly. <laughs> uh, but anyway, the, the other sister, you know, she lived her life free spending for 15 years and then she started saving, you know, from, for the next 30 years. So basically when both of these sisters get to age 65, they had the exact same amount of money. The sister who put it off, she had to save, I think twice as much, twice as long. Yeah. Anyway, it just, I guess what I'm trying to get across is just the the time value of money, especially when you're young, there's just, it's hard to catch up from if you don't take advantage of it. Absolutely. The biggest thing a lot of my clients say to me is, I wished I had started putting money in a, in an IRA or a Roth or in a savings account when I was younger. Mm -hmm. I wished I had understood it. And, um, and it's not too late. People always are waiting for that big windfall. I'll start a savings when I get the big yeah. bonus. I'll start it when I win the lottery. No, start now. 50 bucks. Start doing it. Yeah. Yeah. yeah no, I used to, uh, I, I was a financial advisor many years ago. And, uh, you know, my favorite story to tell is, you know, I had a guy that we, we were pretty close and, uh, you know, I was always trying to get him to start something, start something for your kids, start something for you, whatever. Okay. You know, well, we're struggling along. And uh, as soon as we get, you know, kind of get ahead of things, I'm going to give you a call. We'll set something up. I'm like, you know, we need to do this sooner rather than later. You know, we went through this conversation for, you know, six months. And then I guess when, uh, you know, June rolled around, he get, I got a phone call. I was like, Hey, uh, we're going to the lake in our new boat. You want to go with us? And I'm like, Where'd you find money to buy? Where, where'd you find money to buy a boat at? You know? Right, <laughs> but right. Unfortunately, you know, that's just the way things are. We would rather the instant gratification of having the boat today versus, you know, having that money in a savings account for, uh, well, not only for our future, our retirement, but in case of disaster, yeah. uh, you know, like this COVID, I think it, um, the pandemic kind of shined a light on people's savings habits. And yeah. it's not, pointing fingers or I don't, I'm not trying to belittle anybody. That's not what this is about. It's more about the realization that we never know what can happen. And sometimes luckily that they put some uh, programs in place to, uh, you know, help the masses. But what I will say is that if this had happened to me or you as an individual, the government's not going to be there to write us a check and to help us out. So I think it just really amplifies the importance of why we need to put money back, no matter how much it hurts, quit, you know, cut down on that uh, Starbucks coffee and maybe, you know, have one brewed at home or, you know, however you can do it. And that's the other thing I think we always think is uh, I have to put this massive sum of money back and, uh, and I'll let you speak to that for a minute, but, you know, sometimes that $5, $10 here, that, that adds up over the years. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, you know, one of the things that I, uh, one of my tips to my clients and people I work with is on Friday afternoons, take out all the $5 bills out of your wallet and put them away so you can't spend them for the weekend. And a bunch of $5 bills adds up pretty quickly if you do that every week. It doesn't have to be a huge amount but you need to cultivate the habit. And right. so that as you're doing stuff, you go, wow, do I really want the Starbucks or do I really want to have an amazing retirement? I think I'll put the five bucks back in my pocket. Right. Yeah. And if you're, um, you know, if you happen to be an employee where you can have the payroll deduction, I tell you the best thing for me as a young person was I had some good advice, uh, surrounding me when I was young. And when I started, when I signed up for the 401k, 
you could do a percentage of your pay. And some guy told me, you know, you're going to get a raise in six months, but he said, set that at the, at the highest you can. I think it was 6% at the time, yeah. set it for that. You're going to hurt for six months. Uh, you know, it wasn't hurting like we weren't going to eat. We weren't going to be able to go have as much fun, but anyway, right. uh, you know, you're going to be kind of throttled back, but he said, when you get your raise, then you won't notice the 6% of that incremental raise you got because it's already gone. And there was so much truth to that from that point on that uh, the initial, uh, you know, that initial time period between then and when you get your next raise, it, it can be a little bit painful, but once you get past that, then it's, you're kind of home free. Absolutely. And even if you can't put in the 6%, if your company matches, take the match, it's free right. money. It's free money. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's for sure. A lot of people don't realize that, that you're just giving that away. Yeah. So um, one thing that you do point out is that uh, we may or may not need financial therapy. So can, yeah. you, can you tell me a little bit about what financial therapy might include? Yeah, so fi financial therapy is really starting to get aware of your family history um, your financial journey. Most of us make financial decisions and a lot of other decisions um, when we're five, six, seven years old. And we, we observe the world, we make decisions, and then we go forward as if a five-year-old should be making these financial decisions. And then what happens is we get into our, our adult life and we start making decisions back to, oh, I'm not good enough. Uh, people are going to judge me. People are going to think I'm greedy. Uh, and, and so we start with these stories and we really bring them into our, our current lives. And so okay. doing therapy helps us to go back and say, oh my gosh, I remember when I was six and I lost the milk money. I remember my dad saying, that's really selfish or whatever it might be. And then we made a story and made it a lifelong commitment. Okay. Yeah. So that kind of leads into also, you know, what does a healthy relationship with money look like? I know that you know, we, uh, I think we see a lot of extremes, either there are people that are so focused on money that they actually miss out on life or they treat people poorly because they, you know, want to get more money. And then there's kind of the opposite of that is that there's some people that, you know, they want to help everybody to the detriment of themselves. Yeah, absolutely. And I think having a healthy relationship with money is about being able to set boundaries to make sure that you do take care of yourself. Um, it means being able to live within your means. It means being able to have a choice of saying, yes, I could spend on this in the moment and feel really good for 10 minutes, or I could save this and know that it's going to help me in the long run and I'm going to have a much more happy life overall. It means learning to be appreciative for what you have, not what you don't have. And right. so I think that gratitude uh, is, is a big part of that, learning to cultivate gratitude and realizing that we're pretty abundant, especially if you're growing up in the U.S. of A., you have it pretty good, even the people that seem like they have it the worst. Yeah. Yeah, and there's all kind, There's always little tricks. You know, for me, one of my tricks was always trying to get rid of, not get rid of, but move money from a spendable account to an account where it was kind of out of sight, out of mind. And yep. I, I'll tell a story on me back, you know, in the day <laughs> I worked when I was younger, I worked for AT&T and we were at this, uh, there was a local, it was a chip, they manufactured chips for their restaurants, but they sold them to the public too. So this cable gets cut behind this building and we're out there working. And this guy I'm working with is like, hey, we ought to go get some chips and hot sauce here. So we went around there and said, we'll just take a, you know, can you give us one chip and a hot sauce? And they're sure. Well, she immediately grabbed the mic and said, Joe, get the forklift and get these, uh, you know, get some chips and hot sauce around here. And we're like, whoa, wait a minute. And they ended up bringing out a whole case of chips and a whole case of hot sauce. And luckily between the two of us, we had enough money to pay for it. So we just, you know, we ended up paying for it. A life lesson, you know, I quit carrying cash after that. And like, you know, I, <laughs> I used to have like, and this has been a long time ago, but you know, I would have like a $5 allowance for the week that would get me, you know, buy me some coffee, coffee yeah. break or Coke break or whatever. But uh, I just find myself, if I have money in my pocket, it tends to go much faster. 
today we can equate that, I guess, with the bank account, a debit card, it can go easy. So, you know, there are a lot of, um, you know, the paycheck, we talked about that, the auto deduction, but in, in your bank account, you can also get other accounts that will draft that account. So when you get paid, you can move money out of there to the savings account, and then it just won't show up in your checking account or, you know, your spendable account, I guess. Yeah, absolutely. And I think it's even better to have a separate bank for your savings so that it okay. can't automatically cover overdraft because <laughs> otherwise right. it's just really a, a slush fund. <laughs> right, exactly. No, that's a good point. That's a good point. Yeah. And, you know, we'll kind of get back to the business for just a minute. That that was um, I didn't do the separate banks. That would have been good. But what I did was uh, early on opened up a uh, I had a, a tax account and I had a, a SEP account. Well, not only the accounts, but I had bank accounts. So whenever I would get client money that would come in, I would just automatically take whatever my percentage was, you know, through, you know, I had my account, it worked out the percentage and said, look, you got to pull out 20% for taxes and you need 10, 15% for your SEP. And so every time I had a client check come in, I would segregate it and put it back immediately, you know, and then, the discipline of not to try to reach out to use those accounts. But I think, yeah. you know, for me, fortunately, you know, it was just a way to get it away from the regular bank account, know that it wasn't mine to spend. So, you know, I guess we have to find all the, the uh, little tricks that we have to help our, to do that we can do to help ourselves to be able to not only, like I said, save for what our future expense is going to be, but also save for our future. Well, absolutely. And for myself, when I set up my corporation and had my separate bank accounts, I was much more focused on protecting my business than when I was a Schedule C and I was sort of commingling it. Uh, when I finally went, this is a business, this is separate and I need to nurture and protect it. I gave it a lot more attention and a lot more uh, like just really focus. Exactly. And that's, a, um, you know, that's another good point. I, I know that um, we, we think about, uh, accounting and, and things like that at the end of the year where we just have somebody, uh, plug in, uh, numbers into a, um, to our tax return or whatever, but there's also, there's so many strategies that, um, you know, our CPA, our tax experts can help us with through the year in order to well keep us on track are we actually making money what does this product look like if you have multiple product lines but also kind of like you said that protection that we can give protect ourselves from our business protect our business from ourselves. however yeah. you want to look at that you know there are a lot of different things that we can do absolutely you know one of the things that's interesting is and this happens a lot with my clients i'll send them a draft of their tax return and they'll write back and they'll go this is wrong this is wrong. And I'm what, what's wrong? I didn't make $300,000. Okay. Well, did you make this deposit? Yeah. Did you make this deposit? Yeah. Did you make this deposit? Yeah. Did you make the, that equals 350? Well, where did it go? I, well, I don't know. That's a separate question, but you made the money and that <laughs> right. happens all the time. Right. Yeah. So I guess the, the message is, you know, also too, is to, to reach out and uh, your, your financial professional, whether you have a fractional CFO or it's your CPA or accounting person, whatever, is you need to have a relationship with them through the year. It's not a once a year check in and uh, you'll be OK because there's a lot of strategies and, you know, the the bulletins that come out. That's another thing. You know, I'm a finance guy. I could probably find my way through putting numbers in TurboTax, but there's so many uh there's so many rules that come out through the year yeah. that I don't keep up with that, you know, professionals like yourself, you keep up on all these taxable changes and tweaks, some for the better, some for the worse, but right. at least you know what they are. So we're not, you know, stepping into a bear trap. Well, absolutely. And I just was saying to a new client the other day when I, I said, well, this is what we charge for a tax return with the Schedule C. And I could hear a little bit of like, well, that's a little high. And I said, you know what? I could probably do your tax return in five minutes. Uh, you're not paying me for the speed at which I input your taxes. You're actually paying me for the knowledge and for the right. education and saving you hundreds of thousands of dollars potentially over time. Uh, it might be worth that extra two or 300 bucks. Yeah. 
Yeah, and also the uh, the uh, potential prison time that you can, <laughs> you can help people avoid as well. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> uh, so um, I know that you went on a trip. To, I guess you had a, a pivotal moment. You were on a trip to Africa. So what what happened while you were in Africa that changed some of your beliefs around money? Yeah, so, you know, before that trip, I really believed that uh, I was socialized to believe that I am my accomplishments. I got to make a lot of money. You got to have nice things, material things to be happy. And uh, and that was sort of my, uh, those were my goals. And when I went to Africa, I was in Tanzania and the average income there was annual income was $100 a year. Uh, and uh, not a lot of money. And, yes. uh, and this was back in the 90s, but still. Uh, not a lot of money. And these people were incredibly happy. They were like, tell everybody to come and visit us if you liked it. Uh, they would give me the shirt off their back. Uh, you know, I was throwing away jars and they were like, can I have that jar? And I'm like, it's trash. They're like, no, I can use this. And I just kept saying to myself, what's wrong with these people? They're too happy. They don't have nice things and they don't have hot water and they don't there's something wrong. And it really had took me some self-reflection to realize that they were all about community. They were all about living an experienced life with good experience, good family, good community, yeah. and that they could be incredibly happy and learn to work with what they had instead of running around in this hamster wheel of trying to get somewhere when they were actually already there. Exactly. That's a huge point. And, um, you know, I had an experience, it's been a few years ago when my grandmother passed away. Uh, she lived in an older home that had the detached garage that had some storage in. And so we're in there cleaning it out. And um, we just ran across hundreds of mason jars, hundreds of um, like pot pie and uh, tins that you get at the store with the cakes in it. She saved everything. You know, and it, it was, it's interesting because she had come through the depression. And so yeah. that really set her on this path of what was important and the scarcity, I guess, is the best way to say it. And so foil, you know, she, she would get foil and try to wash it off as good as she could and save it. And we just don't realize, uh, well, I think we've learned a little bit through the pandemic. And of course, us here in Texas this last week have learned with the uh, storms is that, you know, scarcity can come upon us in a heartbeat. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. And I, I, you know, for me, I also have a little bit of that scarcity mindset. I've got six months of food in my pantry. Yeah. I've got all those things and um, I'll probably always have that. Um, I just don't let myself go crazy with it. I, I you know, I can right. be compulsive, but I have to go, whoa, slow it down. Life is okay. Right. <laughs> right, right. So um, you also, uh, an interesting story that uh, you went to Nepal and you uh, were trekking to the base camp of Everest, which that's that's amazing in itself. What Again, we could probably do a whole podcast, of, but tell us a little bit about surrounding that trip. I mean, that must have been incredible. Yeah, so uh, Nepal is an amazing place. I love it. Uh, and I've been there a couple of times. So on the second trip, uh, I really, I had some friends, we all wanted to get to base camp. That was our goal. And uh, some people were experienced, some weren't. And we hiked the first day just to get into the park and you go down the steep hill to go back up the steep hill. And at the end of the first day, all of my friends, everybody on the team said, this is really hard. Let's quit. Let's just go back in town and get massages. And I'm like, no, we, I, I just spent a lot of money we got to finish this trip. You know, I'm being practical. I spent money and uh, nobody wanted to take the, everybody was ready to quit. And so I, I said, what I got to do something. I'm, I'm, I'm the team leader here. I said, how about this? Why don't we negotiate? Let's agree to hike an hour. And at the end of the hour, let's see if we want to continue. And so what we did was every hour I set my watch and we would stop and we would decide, are we going to hike another hour or are we going to go back? And what happened was after the first couple of days, we started saying, let's see if we can hike two hours and then let's hike four hours. And what I found was that when we took it in baby steps, when we took it incrementally, instead of trying to look at, we've got to get from here to the top of the base camp, let's just get from here to that next little 
mountain. Right. Let's get yeah. to this next little gully. And and that's how we got we got to the top was really negotiating it uh, hour by hour instead of, yeah. oh my God, we've got 15 days to get there. Yeah, and that, that's a, you know, I was having a conversation with a, a client prior to our call and that was something that we got to talking about is just sometimes it's a good life lesson because sometimes tasks can just be daunting or overwhelming that we just can't even get started. We can't find yeah. the motivation to get started. It's like, it's so big, we'll never accomplish it. Let's just, and you know, I guess we can talk about saving for retirement in that, in a vein is that, yeah. uh, you know, it seems like, oh my gosh, how can we ever amass the amount of money we need? But going back to the baby steps, the $5 a week, you know, taking out all the $5, it adds up. And that's a great way to approach uh, money management and savings for sure. Yeah, absolutely. And I think the other important thing for a lot of people out there that feel like it's overwhelming or struggle is ask for help. It's okay to ask people, how did you do it? What can I do? What would you recommend? What are your tips? So that you can do it. Yeah. Let's touch on retirement for just a minute. I think, um, you know, this is a lesson that we you know, as financial advisors that we try to talk to people about is that, uh, well, not only are you going to need a lot of money and not only are we living much, much longer past our working retirement age, but the other part of this is that when, when uh, <clears throat> there's some uh, misnomer that when you retire, all of a sudden you, you only need 25% of your current income. And I guess for some people, if you're making a ton of money, maybe that may be right. right. But, you know, for, <clears throat> excuse me, for the normal person, it's like uh, when you retire, life doesn't quit. I mean, you still have the same bills and actually right. you find in the short term, your expenses can probably go up because now you got time to travel. You got time to go out to eat. You got time to catch up with friends. So it's like, uh, I think, recent retirees can be very shocked about the burden, the financial burden that may be on them still. Yeah, absolutely. And it's interesting, you know, the old model used to say, put away all your money, you'll be in a lower tax bracket when, when you retire. Right. And that's not true. Uh, most of my retirees are still in the same tax bracket, if not higher tax brackets, right. as they're pulling money, getting their pensions, pulling out RMDs um, from their IRAs and stuff. Uh, what I work with a lot of clients is now trying to get money when they have lulls in their income is to convert it to Roth or convert it to uh, post-tax so that we're not getting in those higher brackets. But, you know, I tell people, look, when I get to retirement, I don't want to be eating beans, sitting in a little, you know, not turning on the heat because I, I want to <laughs> save every penny. I want to be like carried around on a carriage. I want like grapes right. served to me. I want to be making income. And so I have to plan accordingly that I'm going to be in a high bracket when I'm in retirement. Yeah. And the, you know, the other part of that too is, uh, you know, something that's come to mind a lot lately is, you know, outliving our wellness. And so we have to also take into account that, um, we may not be able to work into our seventies, you know, if we were healthy and, and everything, maybe so, but a lot of times, whether it's physical or, uh, other ailments that get us that, uh, we maybe would be not able to produce an income or go get up and go to work. So we have to think about those things as well. Yeah. And I think it's important for a lot of people to look at their social security. When am I going to take it? Do I take it early and take a little bit less or do I wait and take it later where I'm going to get a larger amount uh, for some of my clients and for many of my clients taking it earlier means I'm getting it I'm getting money for five years more than if I waited until I was you know 72 or something like that and yeah. so it's really important to actually do the math and and see where you are because I have clients right now that are struggling and if they didn't have that social security taken early they wouldn't be paying their rent yeah well and I think that times have changed, you know, from back in the time when I did my financial advising is, you know, most people were still on defined pension plans. And I, right. I don't think we, uh, people don't fully grasp the, uh, I guess, 
the enormity of that change or what I see as that, yeah. you know, and for those that are, don't know what that is, basically, you know, in the old days you worked, you retired and your company said, if you were fortunate enough to work for a company that had retirement, they said, we're going to pay you X number of dollars for the rest of your life or you know, you could take less and your spouse could keep up, you know, there are variables, right. but basically they said, this is what you're going to get. And then I guess maybe around the 2000s, somewhere in there, we kind of switched over. And I think most people now are on the, what is it? A, a defined contribution where it's right. mainly the, the company's going to throw some money in, you're going to throw some money in at the end of time, there's going to be a pile of money and it's up to you to manage it, to get That's right to make it last long enough to, to match your lifespan. Yeah, absolutely. And most people, it's interesting, most people that are doing that don't even realize what their money's sitting in. I've had clients that we go in and look at their funds and realize they've been sitting it in a savings account, even though it's in a, and I'm like, of course, it's not making any money for you. You're not investing it. Oh, right. I just thought if it was a, a retirement account, it's automatically doing that. Yeah. Yeah, and that's another thing we could talk just quickly about is that an investment cycle, the advantages to getting in when you're in your 20s and 30s is if you look at the markets over time, you know, what is it? I mean, there's all kinds of saying it's like time in the market, not timing the market. Yeah. I had a finance professor that his favorite saying was, you know, bears make money, bulls make, make money and hogs get slaughtered. And, you know, that's, that's trying to, you know, buy in at the bottom and cash out at the top. It just doesn't right. work that way. But if you look at the markets over time, and I haven't in a while, but I'm sure it still probably runs true that yep. if you're in this for 30 years, you are going to make a good return as long as you have appropriate investment, not highly aggressive and not uh, highly safe, but if you're in the middle of the road and have good portfolio mix, you are going to make a decent return over a 30, 40 year period. Absolutely. And again, that's where emotions are so important. Don't get emotional and panic when the market drops. If you cash out, that is a loss. <laughs> You've lost yeah. the money. Um, right. You, yeah. Yeah. So, so many things, but, um, uh, so before we start wrapping up, I'm going to ask you, uh, who is the, who was the favorite or the most famous, most, your favorite, most famous comic that you've seen come through the comedy store? You know, that would, even though they came before me, I would probably say the, the most famous comic that I really love and appreciate was, uh, Richard Pryor. Okay. Um, you know, his, uh, what was humorous to us was also his life story and a lot of his pain. Um, and if you actually, you know, read his biographies, if you read about him and stuff, uh, an amazing person, but incredibly, incredibly uh, talented. Right. Yeah, he was a good one. You know, that was back in the days when they used to release uh, a lot of albums. And I don't know That's that right. they still do that, but back in the I guess the mid to late seventies, these comedians, they would release uh, full length albums with just the uh, shows and material that they had. Yeah, no, totally. It's a whole, it's a whole different world, but they've all got yeah. podcasts now. <laughs> <laughs> all, right. all right, Bob. Well, uh, what is a tool that you use in your life? And it could be personal uh, or it could be professional, but uh, what is a tool or a habit or ritual, something that you do every day that really adds value? So the thing that I do every day, um, and I purposely have a dog to make me do this, I get up every morning around 6 or 6.30, and I walk for an hour with my dog. And while I'm walking, I express my gratitude, and I do affirmations of welcoming in all that I want. And again, just going back to just reaffirming my gratitude for everything. And that really puts me in a good frame of mind when I start my day to remember that even when I think it's terrible or something, I didn't get my favorite coffee. Like right. I can go back and say, you know what? Life's actually pretty amazing. And I'm actually grateful. Yeah. You're right about that. We have so many things to be thankful for. And I've got the dog, you know, I guess it's not really a blessing, but we've got the dogs too. And 
they help us get up because after it's either like get up or get eaten. <laughs> you know, it makes <laughs> makes right. you jump out of bed and start the day. <laughs> yep, absolutely. <laughs> uh, well, tell us a little bit about uh, you know who who is your client, how can you help them, and then uh, of course how they can get a hold of you. But then also yep. tell us about uh, you know the money nerve as well. Yeah, absolutely. So in my accounting practice, we work with everybody. I've got kids that we have now become adults from their parents. Um, we, we work with a range of people. I work with a lot of entrepreneurs. I, learn, I mm-hmm. love working with people that are out there trying to create their own uh, impact in the world. Uh, work with a lot of retirees. Um, okay. And uh, in, the, in the money nerve arena, we work again with all walks of life because we all have emotions around money, depending on what stage we're at. If we're getting older, we might be a little panicked. If we're younger, we're trying to figure out what we need to do. And so uh, anybody that has any kind of relationship with money, we're going to work with. Okay. Uh, yeah. You don't have okay. to be super rich to work with us. Okay. You just okay. have to be nice. <laughs> yeah, right. Exactly. <laughs> All right. Well, how can they reach out and get a hold of you? So they can reach out to me at info at the money nerve, and that's nerve, N-E-R-V-E, not nerd. I am a nerd, but it's the money nerve, <laughs> info at the money nerve. Um, they can ch- check out our website. We have a lot of resources. We've got articles. We've got tools. Um, we've got an honest budget uh, quit uh, program they can use. We've got a money quiz they can do just to sort of get a sense of where their money nerves are. And uh, yeah. people can reach out. We, we interact with our clients and people that reach out to us. Okay. I like that. The money nerd. That's, that's a good one. <laughs> uh, all right, Bob. Well, thanks again for taking time out of your day. Y'all reach out, uh, check out Bob, go over to the money nerve and, uh, you know, see this good material he's got. It's never like we've talked about in this show, never too late to get started, but the earlier you can get in this and get involved, the better off you're going to be. So uh, check it out. That's going to do it for another episode of the Business of Business podcast. I'm Roy, and uh, you can find us at www.thebusinessofbusinesspodcast.com. We're also on all the major social media, Facebook, uh, Instagram, Twitter. A uh, live, The uh, uh, video of this will go up on YouTube as well when this episode goes live. So check us out. We're also on all all the major podcast platforms, iTunes, Google, Stitcher, Spotify. If we're not on one that you use, reach out. We'll be glad to get it added on. So until next time, take care of yourself and take care of your business.